So um, I'm going to give you uh, two lectures today uh, on multidimensional and nonlinear uh, mechanism design. Uh, and I'm going to be looking at both uh, optimal mechanisms and when optimal mechanisms get uh, too complicated, I'm going to be looking at uh, approximation to the optimal mechanisms. Um, the, this is uh, lecture is divided into two parts, the first part before lunch, the second part after lunch. Um, in the first part, I'm going to talk about uh, how to construct good multiplayer mechanisms from good single player mechanisms. Okay, this is going to be a reduction, so essentially uh, all you need to do is solve the single player mechanisms after you see this portion of the talk, and you'll be able to identify optimal multiplayer mechanisms. Um, and the next uh, portion of the talk after lunch will then fill in the missing piece, which is how do you identify good single player mechanisms? Uh, okay. Um, so these two lectures are actually um, covering two chapters of a textbook that's been in preparation for quite some time now, but it's actually going to come out soon. So this is uh, chapter eight and nine in uh, this textbook, which is all available online. And uh, if you want uh, to get deeper understanding or uh, see more details of proofs, I re uh, refer you to this text. Um, uh, this textbook's about mechanism design and approximation, and uh, in particular, the perspective I have is something like this, uh, 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 these drawings by Picasso, uh, where he starts off drawing very detailed pictures of a bull, and then tries to distill it down to what the essence of a bull really is, what's important about a bull that makes it a bull. And uh, that's sort of the approach that I want to take with mechanism design. I don't want a complicated, detailed mechanism that gets every aspect, minute aspect of it right. I don't want this picture of a mechanism. I want this picture, which sort of tells what are the important ideas, the things I need to think about uh, to design good mechanisms. Okay, I'm not actually going to um, go more into uh, the philosophy of approximation. I think Tim did a really excellent job uh, uh, in his lecture sort of motivating it. And so I'm going to assume we are interested in this idea, and I'm just going to do it. Okay, um, so my goal uh, for these two lectures is to uh, describe a theory of multidimensional and nonlinear mechanism design, uh, which has been notoriously challenging. Uh, but I'm going to try to design a theory of it that's as easy to work with as the single dimensional linear case that uh, is super established and is actually quite easy to work with. Um, and so hopefully this, this theory will be able to have, um, hopefully with this theory we'll, we'll start being able to tackle much more challenging and much richer problems in the space of, of multidimensional mechanism design, just like the, the single dimensional theory abled, enabled a lot of subsequent work in, with single, dimension, uh, single dimensional agents. Um, and so I want to recall uh, a little bit about how the single dimensional theory uh, works at a very high level. Um, and I want to point out two things. You use virtual values in the single agent problem to solve the multi-agent problem. If I want to determine which agent to allocate to, I give it to the agent with a higher virtual value. Right? So that helps me decide how to solve the multi-agent problem of which, which agent should get items. They also actually solve a single agent problem. If I'm just looking at a single agent problem, I want to know which types should get uh, the item. Uh, and I have a constraint on what may, maybe measure of types can get the item. Then I want to give it to the types with a higher virtual value. Okay? So this theory of virtual values lets us very ably sort of solve both these problems. I give you a single agent, single dimensional problem, you'll solve it with virtual values. I give you a multi-agent problem, you'll solve it with virtual values. I am always going to be looking at revenue, and um, my philosophy on uh, various objectives you might consider in mechanism design is that uh, social welfare is sort of unique in that there is one mechanism that's always optimal for social welfare, the VCG mechanism, um, at least in the quasi-linear case. Uh, and sort of any other objective you look at like is probably going to look a lot more like revenue. So if you looked at something like consumer surplus, which is the surplus minus the payments, it's going to look more like revenue. 
Okay, so that's what I'm going to be looking at today, and it's, uh, you could, but you can take it and apply this to other objectives that aren't welfare. Okay, so um, I would like to do this basic thing for multidimensional, uh, for multidimensional and nonlinear agents. Okay, and as some of you probably know, it's not going to always work out great. And so when it doesn't work out great, I'm going to try to approximate what's optimal using an approach like this. Okay. Um, and as I said before, this first part is going to be part one of the talk, and the second part is going to be part two, which is after lunch. Okay, I want to give you some um, uh, results that I will be touching on. These are just examples of things you can prove in this framework, and uh, in the interest of not boring you with tons of examples, I've only picked a couple of ones of each method. Okay, so uh, there are really lots and lots of things you can do with this. So um, for multidimensional agents, think of the following problem. I have a car. I can paint it red or blue when I sell it, but I have one car. And I'm going to sell this to agents. And let's assume the agents' values are IID and uniform on the 0, 1 uh, square, meaning their value for a red car is uniform 0, 1. Their value for a blue car is uniform 0, 1. But they have different multidimensional values for the two colors. OK? And um, the result we're going to show is that the second price auction with reserve, which only sells the player the favorite color car, uh, is optimal. Uh, in some sense, in this particular setting, there's no advantage to second degree price discrimination, meaning offering differentiated, pro uh, the, not the favorite item to the guy. Uh, uh, you don't get more revenue from that. Okay. Um, for nonlinear agents, and a uh, canonical example I'm going to be looking at is uh, values are uniform 0, 1, and there's a common budget for the agents. Um, and then here, uh, the all pay auction with a reserve where you iron the top interval of types. So the highest types all get ironed and they pay their budget. Uh, the middle types will be competing for the good, and the lower types are reserve priced out. Okay? Um, it's the all pay auction with reserve where the and actually, in an all-pay auction, the, the agents will automatically iron the top, so you don't have to do anything. They're not going to bid more than their budget. Um, so that's the optimal auction. OK, good. Um, these kinds of things can get complicated when you have nonlinear agents. So I want to show you an example theorem of what things look like. This, is, this actually seems pretty simple, right? But if, if you go to asymmetry and you go to more complicated settings, it's going to get complicated quickly. Um, so I want to show you an example theorem of what, uh, you would, uh, what things would look like uh, if you wanted to approximate. So this is an interactive mechanism where people bid in equilibrium. Here's another mechanism, a very simple mechanism. I'm just going to go through the agents in sequence and offer them at price B, their budget, a outcome that gives them the item with probably 1 over n plus B. Okay. So it's just a lottery. So you pay me B, I'm going to flip a coin and sometimes give you the item, sometimes not. I'm going to go through the agents in sequence until one of them buys and, and actually the coin comes up heads and I give them the item. Okay? So that mechanism is an E over E minus 1 approximation, uh, which is 1.58. I write my approximations as numbers bigger than 1. I want them to be small. This uh, contrasts with how Tim wrote his uh, approximations as numbers less than 1. And he wanted them to be big. Um, 1.58 is 1 over 0.63. It's the exact same approximation factor Tim was showing in his talk. Okay, so that's an example theorem here when things get complicated. That's a simple mechanism that doesn't do this complicated ironing and complicated uh, reserve pricing. It just offers a posted price, uh, a, a posted price over lotteries. And the first person who comes and wants to buy and then receives the item from the lottery uh, <coughs> wins the item. Sorry, what? I should have said, yeah, N is the number of players. No, I'm saying it's 1 over N plus B. Right? No. no. 1 over N plus B. 1 over N plus B. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it's uniform 0, 1, so B is in 0, 1 here. Um, if B is uh, too big, then there's no budget constraint. Mm -hmm. So I've assumed the budget was binding here. If the budget's not binding, then I'll do something else. 
Yeah, so, uh, sorry. And I'm going to sometimes leave out some sort of uninteresting cases from my slides and maybe not say it. Um, so I'm going to be sometimes just talking about the sort of the interesting case. And so, yes, yeah, so I left out the case the budget wasn't binding. That's an uninteresting case of budgets. Um, great. Okay. Um, so this was a little bit disappointing because it was only for a special uniform 01 case. What can we say for sort of any product distribution? And in fact, we can say if I just have one agent, I'm, and I'm now going to say the one agent result, one agent, and they have a, a value for selling the red or blue car, which is uniform 01. In fact, I, I don't care how many colors of car there are. Any, any number of colors of car, then offering a uniform virtual price where these virtual values are just the single dimensional virtual values if they only wanted that one color. Okay? So uniform virtual price is going to give you a full approximation to the optimal, complex, as uh, Sergio talked about in his, in his lecture, possibly randomized mechanism. So this is very much a result sort of in the same spirit that Sergio was talking about. All right, so those are sort of my example results. And the goal of this talk is to give you the general, the, the, this, these two talks is to give you the general uh, framework that lets you derive results like this, these quite easily. Good. Um, so I'm going to start with um, a warm up, which I, I assume I can go through very quickly because this is a, a mechanism design uh, summer school. And I assume you've seen the single dimensional case already. But I'm going to do it in my notation and quickly. Um, and I'm going to do it actually following the, the uh, Bulow and Roberts treatment. OK? So um, think of selling a single item to multiple agents or with an IID distribution as your example. Um, so here's my distribution. Um, I'm going to actually not want to think about distributions this way. I'm going to define the quantile of an agent to be the probability that that agent is uh, weaker than a random draw from the distribution. OK, so an agent has some value. How strong is that value compared to other draws from the same distribution? OK, and then I'm going to define the value function of quantile to just sort of invert that process. OK, so the value for quantile Q is the inverse of the CDF of 1 minus Q. OK, so strong agents have low quantile, weak agents have high quantile. So that's just taking this plot here and rotating it that way. OK, and that's called the inverse demand curve. OK, um, I want to define uh, the revenue for some um, constraint on the probability I allocate. OK, so if I only, I say, I want you to consider this agent by himself, and I want you to allocate with at most probability uh, it should be Q hat. Um, then what revenue would you get? And that is R of Q hat. Okay, and I'll call that the Q hat ex ante mechanism, meaning given an ex ante constraint, allocate with at most uh, probability Q hat. Um, uh, what's the revenue you would hope to get optimally? Okay, and um, just some notation that I like to use. Um, so Q is a quantile that corresponds to an agent drop in the distribution. Q hat will be sort of a, a threshold, uh, a constraint on quantiles or something. And you can think of this as constraining the quantiles to be stronger than Q hat, which is why I use this notation. Okay, so things with hats on them will be like constraints, and things without hats will be like agents. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, let's just plot the revenue from posting price V of Q hat. Well, if I post price V of Q hat, all the agents who are stronger than Q hat, so the agents who have quantile zero to Q hat, all buy. There's a Q hat measure of them. So my revenue is just Q hat times V of Q hat. I can plot, uh, that's this area. Uh, I can plot that as a function. Q times V of Q hat might look like this. And then the revenue curve, the best revenue I can get is to basically concavify this. Take the concave hull of it. OK, so if I was giving you some Q hat in here, instead of just posting that price, you would mix over two posted prices to get the point on the line. OK, good. Um, allocation rules. So I'm going to do my allocation rules also in quantile space. So y of q is going to be the probability that an agent with a quantile q wins. Um, 
And this should be a decreasing function of quantile, because remember, low quantiles are strong players. They're higher value players. High quantiles are weak players or lower value players. It's a decreasing function of quantile. Okay? Um, and I want to define uh, the revenue of an allocation uh, rule to be the optimal expected revenue I can get with that allocation rule. Okay, and then um, the theorem <coughs> that comes from the analysis of uh, Meyerson and uh, Buell and Roberts is that the revenue is equal to the marginal revenue, the surplus of marginal revenue. Okay, so I look at what the allocation rule does. I, I add up all the marginal revenues of the people served by the allocation rule um, in expectation, and that is equal to the revenue. Okay, so I want to give you some intuition for this. Notice that R of Q, at least if we're in the regular case, is the optimal revenue from a step function at Q, meaning I serve all the players with value with, who are stronger than Q. I serve none of the players afterwards. Okay? So I can write any monotone decreasing function as a convex combination of step functions. Okay? So I'm just going to do that. And what is the derivative? The, the, the coefficients of the probability I run any one of the step functions, it is minus the derivative of y. So remember, y is decreasing, so minus the derivative is positive. So that's the sort of density I'm going to uh, run any of the step functions to get this monotone decreasing allocation rule. OK? So having said that, I can tell you just by convexity, the optimal revenue has to be at least the revenue I get from taking these convex combinations. And if I was to run the um, q hat, I would get r of q. So I just get basically the density, the probability I ran that mechanism times the revenue I get from running that mechanism. Right? And integrating by parts gets the familiar expression. Uh, the uh, revenue is uh, at least the marginal revenue. Um, I said at least because I'm optimizing revenue's concave. Uh, revenue is a convex function. Um, and you can get a lower bound showing that it's actually equal to, but I'm going to talk about that later. The pur purpose of this part of the talk was just to get you familiar with my notation and sort of a, a, a sketch of the basic proof, not to go into the details. When you, when you say optimal expected revenue for this Y I'm going to define that more precisely in a few slides. Well, I, yeah. I'm assuming, I mean, usually revenue is determined up to a constant so here's integration. So does it just mean it's Yeah, yeah, yeah. Constant? So um, <laughs> for single dimensional players, when I want you to use exactly Y, then these are all equalities. But because R might take this step function, it might iron, it might use something weaker, then it might do something less than Y. I see, okay. Okay, so that's why I've sort of okay. been a little bit vague here. Right. It's because of ironing. If you're not ironing, these will all be equalities and obviously equalities. Why do you want to iron? Why might you want to do that? So that comes from um, this picture. Just I want it, if I had to sell with some ex-ante probability, I would rather mix over this price and this price then post this price. Um, you're exactly right. So once I've written it this way, you don't have to even think about ironing. The revenue f curve will automatically do the ironing for you. And so you don't have to think about it. OK, I just wanted to get this notation down and remind ourselves of the usual proof of this. Um, and because uh, I'm going to be basically repeating this over and over and over again in different environments. OK, um, but uh, just to complete the picture, so what is what I call the marginal revenue mechanism? Sometimes people call this Meyerson's mechanism. Um, I call it the marginal revenue mechanism because that's what it's doing. Uh, you map values to quantiles. You calculate the marginal revenues for agent quantiles. You serve the agents to maximize the total marginal uh, a surplus of marginal revenues subject to feasibility of the allocation. Um, and then the outcome and payment for each player is while you look at the minimum quantile at which they would still be served by their um, uh, ex ante mechanism uh, in R, and that's the critical quantile, you offer them that ex ante mechanism. So it's kind of like in the single dimensional case, it's like find the price that is the minimum price the person would have had to bid to win, and then offer that price. Okay, and uh, so if you maximize marginal revenue point-wise, which is what we're doing for every input we maximize marginal revenue, then we've certainly maximized it in expectation. 
okay? And we know that expected marginal revenue is equal to expected revenue, so we've optimized expected revenue and expectation, and it's optimal, uh, and, and so it's optimal. Okay, and I used the fact that the revenue curve was kind uh, cave, which meant the marginal revenues were monotone, and so this is a monotone allocation rule, but I, you guys all know that. Okay, so the usual example, uh, selling a car to, but not painting a different color, it's just one car, uh, uniform zero one. So the uniform distribution has value function one minus Q. Um, so uh, Q times the value of Q is uh, Q minus Q squared, which is this function. That's R of Q, its derivative is one minus two Q, that's this function. Uh, so how do I maximize this? Well, you serve the agent with the highest positive value of, of, of R prime, of the marginal revenue, which is the agent with the smallest quantile less than one half. Okay, so what is that mechanism? Smallest quantile less than one half. Well, smallest quantiles are ordered in order of values, so that's the largest value that's at least the value that corresponds to quantile one half, which is also one half. Okay, that's my review of single dimensional uh, agents. Uh, good. So here's the agenda for the rest of this part. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of single agent optimal mechanisms. Okay, uh, for various single agent problems. I'm not going to derive why these examples are optimal. I'm just going to say what they are and uh, what, they, what they look like. Uh, and using the structure we'll observe from these single agent optimal mechanisms, we're gonna then look at reducing uh, multi-agent problems to the single agent problems that, we, that I'm gonna just have talked about. So I'm part zero was single oh, dimensional linear dimensional. agents, which I already talked about. Yeah. Um, so then I'm going to give you some examples of single agent optimal mechanisms for multidimensional and nonlinear player, multidimensional nonlinear preferences. Okay? Um, and I'm just going to give you the examples, and we're going to derive those in part two after lunch. Okay? Um, so uh, then uh, we're going to give what I call the ex ante reduction, which is going to look a lot like uh, the thing we just saw. In other words, I want to reduce the problem of optimizing a multi-agent problem to these ex ante uh, uh, optimization problems for each player. Meaning, uh, if I want to sell to the player optimally with ex ante probability Q hat, what's the best way to do that? Okay. Um, I'm then going to show that, well, that's not going to always be optimal to do that. And when it's not optimal, I'm going to show that we can uh, use an approximate reduction when we don't have this revenue linearity property, which implies that it's optimal. Okay? And then the last thing I'm going to do, if, uh, which I might end up actually uh, not doing and leave you to read in the, in the book, um, is the interim reduction, meaning how you do the optimal mechanism without this revenue linear property that I'm going to identify. Okay? Um, some goals, overarching goals in this agenda. Uh, one of my goals is a unified framework, and the other goal is to highlight the difference between the case where the single agent problems are revenue, what I call revenue linear, and the case where they're not, because this is going to really change how complex the optimal mechanism is. When they're revenue linear, I'll get a simple ex ante reduction like the marginal revenue mechanism, and when they're not, I'll have to do more complicated things um, like uh, optimal control, or um, uh, optimization subject to interim feasibility, which uses borders condition, or et cetera, which we'll talk about when we get there. Okay, so examples of single agent optimal mechanisms, uh, and I'm gonna be talking about public budgets and um, the uh, multi-dimensional player who's uniform on the square, like my examples, and those come from LaFont and Robert and Armstrong. on the next slide. Okay, so public budget preferences. This is a single dimensional nonlinear setting. So I'm going to be allocating uh, a, with probability between zero and one and charging a payment. The player's got a private value T. There's a public budget, so it's known what the budget is beforehand. Um, and the utility of the player 
is their surplus minus their payment as long as they pay less than their budget and they do not like paying more than their budget. Okay, so my running example is going to be uniform zero one and uh, budget equals one quarter. Okay, so um, a first question you might ask if you were trying to figure out what a single, what were, what were optimal mechanisms for a single agent with a budget um, is, well, what if I just had a constraint on the probability that I could sell to this guy ex ante? So suppose I had an ex ante constraint of one half. I want you to come up with the best mechanism that sells to this guy with ex ante probability one half. So an expectation over the realized types and whatever randomization mechanism does, this guy buys with probability at most one half. So here is a mechanism that does this. Okay, and don't check the numbers, but I offer them to win the item with probably three quarters, otherwise losing the item, and he's gonna pay me his budget, which is a quarter, if he wants that. If he doesn't want that, he pays me nothing and goes home. Okay, so take it or leave it offer of that lottery. Okay, so you can, you can map out who's going to buy this. Okay, and it's exactly the types who, um, the types who have value bigger than uh, one third. Okay, and those types buy that and they are gonna win with probability three quarters because that's the probability of the lottery. The types that don't buy it get nothing and so the allocation rule in type space, now I do, when I do allocation rules in type space, I do X's. And as in the previous slide, in quantile space, I do Y's. Um, okay. Okay, so that's what this mechanism looks like. And you can check that uh, three quarters times one third is uh, one quarter of the budget. That's the right payment for a single dimensional agent. If you pay one price one half. It's conditional on getting the object. No. no. This is more like an all pay kind of a rule. You right. pay me a quarter, okay, and I'm gonna give you the lottery, which sometimes you get the item, sometimes you don't. Here is another mechanism. This is the this is the allocation rule that I would get if suppose I just did the following. I had two suppose I had two players uh, who uniform zero one with with budgets, and I said, what's the Bayes Nash equilibrium? Well, the Bayes Nash equilibrium would actually have this allocation rule, okay? Uh, essentially, you'd want to be, if you didn't have a budget, you'd allocate according to the straight line, right? The, uh, the higher types win with probability they're bigger than the other guy, and it's uniform zero one. So it's a straight line as the allocation rule in type space, okay? But that's going to have too high a payment for the high types, and they can't pay that. So what they're going to do is reduce their bid to the budget, which is going to cause some low types to want to actually join the pooled bidders who all bid the budget, because then they win with a higher probability. Um, and so basically the players automatically in equilibrium iron the top of the allocation rule so that the budget uh, binds. Okay, and you can check that um, I did this right and I ironed the right amount so that this area is exactly the budget. So here are two mechanisms. They both serve with ex ante probability exactly one half. Um, notice if I have two players, right, one of them wins half the time, right? So that's ex ante probability one half, that player one wins. Okay, so that was my constraint. So both these have ex ante probability one half of, of, of winning. Um, and so which one is better? That's my question. The ex ante pricing problem is which is, uh, what's the optimal, I mean I gave you examples, but which is better and what's optimal? Any guesses? Uh, the, I disagree. Oh, it's half versus. <laughs> um, so the answer is A is better. And there's a theorem um, which says if your value is uniform zero one uh, and you have an arbitrary budget and the budget is binding, then the uh, ex ante probability plus budget lottery at price B is the optimal mechanism. Budget is binding means if we were to just do the linear thing without thinking about budgets, the high type would pay more than the budget. Budget not binding, we can just post the optimal price 
and the budget doesn't bind, and they're happy to pay the optimum price, and so we don't have to do anything hard. Yeah. And this is subject not to necessarily exactly quality of allocating, but any weekly less probability of um, That is true. And so I'm going to be mostly assuming that it's going to be tight. And again, as I said, I might ignore some sort of edge cases where things aren't binding. OK, so I'm going to assume m my constraints are always binding in most of what I tell you. OK, um, so that's uh, nonlinear preferences. I want to look now at the, my other example scenario, which is multidimensional but linear preferences. OK, so here's a canonical setting, a player's unit demand. There's an allocation uh, x1 and x2, which is the probability you get each good um, with uh, unit demand, so you can't get more than one good. Um, and there's a payment p. Uh, the player has a private value, uh, t1, t2, is the value for each coordinate. And the utility is the dot product of uh, the value for each coordinate and the allocation probability for each coordinate minus the payment. No. Remember, I'm going to derive all of these things. I'm giving you examples of awful mechanisms, and I'm going to derive them in the next part. So what, what I'm missing is that here you're telling me about the multi-agent. No, I didn't tell you about anything multi-agent. Multi no, my problem is the ex-ante pricing problem. Given an ex-ante uh, uh, constraint Q hat that's less than 1 minus the budget, the optimal mechanism for a single player that sells to the player with ex ante probability uh, equal to the constraint is this mechanism. So this is a single player off mechanism. I did not prove it. I'm going to prove it uh, after lunch. I just want you to see what it looks like. It looks like this. Yeah, I understand that. And you're telling us the two agent one now. That's that, that exactly wouldn't. a one agent mechanism. It's just the intuition that it looks like what you did. Yeah. Intuition. So I just, how would I get a. Uh, I wanted another allocation rule to show you, an example of something that wasn't optimal. So where did I get one? I said, well, if I want to sell with the center probably a half, I just run a two-player symmetric auction. Each player wins with probably a half. And so I look at that allocation rule, and that's this. OK, so now I want to talk about unit demand preferences. And the reason why I'm doing this, again, is to contrast how things look okay, versus these two cases. Because the unit demand case will actually be a lot easier than the public budget case. Linear utility. This is a linear oh, function. function. Yeah, some people actually call this quasi-linear. It's actually linear. Right? So, good. So my running example is uniform 0, 1 squared, the distribution of our types. Um, all right, I'm going to ask the same question. Suppose I want to serve my uniform player a red or blue car, OK? And uh, I can serve them a car with prob ex ante probability at most 1 half. What are some ways to do that? Well, here's some way. I can only sell the red car. OK, so I post price of 1 half for the red car with probably uh, 1 half. Uh, yeah, with probably 1 half their values above that, and they buy. OK, I could post a uniform lottery. Meaning, uh, uh, I offer you a price of one half, and I give you a random object. Okay, or I could do this. Okay, so I want to sell this anti probability one half. These are uniform, so I want the area where I don't sell to be exactly one half, right? So that is just um, if this is quantile, it's just uh, t squared. Right, is this area. So um, to, if I want that area to be 1 half, I better set t to be square root 1 half. OK, so this thing, which post sells the person their favorite color at a posted price, is the mechanism that does, that does such. OK, so again, what's optimal? These are all mechanisms that sell with probably 1 half, but I could choose any of them. Uh, the answer is, as you probably guessed, c. OK, and the general theorem is uh, for the revenue alpha mechanism for the ex ante constraint q hat is uniform pricing at price. And then this is the, the equation you get to get the areas right. <laughs>
OK, so that was uh, ex ante optimal mechanism. I give you an ex ante constraint, and I say, what's the best thing that serves with ex ante probability uh, that given ex ante probability? Um, I now want to move on to talk about more complicated single agent problems. Single agent problems where there are constraints that might be induced by an auction. And so high types might uh, have higher probability of being served than lower types. So I want a sort of constraint that's parameterized by how strong the type is. OK, so let me uh, show you what that is. So if I were to give you the allocation rule in type space, that's the probability that any type is served. Um, again, as I said, the quantile of type is the measure of types. I, I can, uh, in a multi-dimensional setting, it's not always clear ex ante which types are stronger. But if I give you a mechanism, I can tell you which types are stronger. The ones that have higher <coughs> allocation probability are stronger types. So I can then order the players by their strength with respect to the allocation rule. So if they got a higher allocation probability, they, in the mechanism, which is an IC mechanism, it must be a stronger type according to that mechanism. OK, um, of course, defining quantiles this way, the quantile is the measure of types with higher allocation probability. Then quantiles are uniform again as before, like I like. Uh, fantastic. And now I can sort of trans go back from type space to quantile space and define my allocation rule in quantile space as the allocation probability of a unit measure of type sorted in non-decreasing order. OK, um, and I find this a little bit confusing to define mathematically. The simple way to think about it is imagine I have a discrete setting where each type shows up with some probability and they get allocated with some probability. So I'm going to imagine that a rectangle where the width is the probability they, of the type showing up and the height is the, uh, the probability they get allocated. I'm going to take this bunch of rectangles and sort them in decreasing order. Okay, And um, so this is what you get. This is what you get if you apply that to the public budget. So here was uh, the budget allocation rule in type space. And I basically just types are inverted in quantile for the single dimensional public budget problem. So I just switched the axis for the uniform distribution. OK, because types are uniform, I can just switch the axis. OK, for the unit demand case, here was my picture. And that translates to this allocation rule. Okay, because the strongest measure of players, which is a half of them, gets served with allocation probability one. So the top guys all get served with allocation probability one, and the bottom guys get served with allocation probability zero. So remember, I'm using the allocation rule for two reasons. One, to tell me how high this plot is, but also to sort it. Right? So I sort quantiles by in, in decreasing order of the allocation probability that the type of that quantile got served. OK, this was you know, sort of a lot of math and notation, but it's so that we can make some theorems really super easy and geometric and intuitive. Yeah? Sorry, to be clear, we're assuming quasi-linearity, but not necessarily linearity in the preferences? Um, for public budget, it's not quasi-linear. For oh, right. the um, unit demand, it is quasi-linear. It's actually linear. But you still have enough to get the usual uh, increasing probability of getting the good with your type? Um, these are just examples. So for these examples, yes. And I defined um, the order of types in quantile space to be the order of the allocation probability. Oh, I see. Okay. And so it's always going to be decreasing in quantile space because I defined it to be decreasing. That's correct. And I don't care. I'm just asking whether you got a car. So I'm projecting the multi-dimensional allocation into a single dimensional, did you get something? OK, and this is actually the thing that's interesting in my red or blue car example. I have one car, right? When I consider how other players exert externalities on this player, it's a one-dimensional externality they exert. Either they got the car or didn't get the car. You don't care what color they got it. So in this example, it's going to be nice to project them into a single dimension just did you get something or not. Huh? Yeah, so um, this happened to be the mechanism that I talked about on the previous slide.
that was trying to be optimal and serve with ex-ante probability one half. Okay, so, it's just so that just came from, it's, that's this picture that I drew on the previous slide translates to this picture in when I draw the allocation rule in quantile space. Yeah, I, on this slide, I said, what's the optimal thing that serves with probability one half? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so if you take it, for example, one third, you can repeat everything. Yeah, except that these lines are going to be a little bit further this way. Okay. Yeah, I'm giving you examples of what things look like. <coughs> okay, I now want to make things a little bit uh, more complicated. Okay, so define the cumulative allocation rule just to be the integral of this allocation rule. So that's a nice concave function because the allocation rule is decreasing, so it's a concave function. Okay, I'm going to say an allocation rule y is feasible for an allocation constraint y hat, which constrains how much I'm allowed to serve strong types versus weak types. If the Q of allocation rule of y at any quantile is less than the Q of allocation constraint of y hat. Okay, what this means essentially is y is allowed to serve strong types with less probability than y hat. It can sort of shift mass down. Okay, shifting mass down means the integral is going to be upper bounded by. Okay, so if you had a mechanism that was serving high types of probably one half, uh, the high types meaning types of value above one half would probably one half, the, the, the top one half measure of types probably one half, and you wanted to not do that, you could sort of make it worse by taking some of the service from high types and giving it to low types. Okay, that's what this says. So I'm going to define the interim. This is, if you want, it's just math. That's fine. Um, I want to define the interim pricing problem as follows. Given an allocation constraint y, find the mechanism of allocation rule y that's feasible for y hat that optimizes revenue. Okay, again, what are the variables here? Well, you get to choose how you optimize revenue for each quanta, uh, for each quanta, and you also get to choose whether you want to be weaker than y hat in some way. One way you might want to be weaker than y hat is reserve price. You just throw out mass. Okay, reserve price, you will throw out mass that's lower, and uh, that's one way to be weaker. Okay, I'm going to define rev of y hat to be the interim optimal revenue for y hat, meaning you solve this optimization problem, and that's my notation for that. Okay, that uh, is abstract, so I want to give you pictures. Okay, let's just take the allocation constraint 1 minus Q. Okay, so that is this dashed line here. Okay, that's 1 minus Q. So if I'm in the uniform public budget problem and I give you the 1 minus Q allocation constraint, I could ask what is the optimal thing to do in terms of revenue? It turns out what you want to do, and that was sort of hinted at in one of my first slides, is iron the strong types to make them so they don't pay more than their budget, and reserve price the low types to keep the payments high. Okay, you iron the high types, you reserve price the low types. Notice ironing takes the mass here and shifts it to here. That's exactly what these cumulative allocation rules were constraint was allowing you to do, shifting ma allocation mass from high types to low types. And you're allowed to also throw it away. Okay, um, mapping that back into type space, you get this allocation rule in type space. Um, what I want to point out, and this is crucial, the places where you're going to be reserve pricing and ironing will depend on where the budget binds. Where the budget binds depends on this area. This area is given in part by where you iron, in part by the original allocation curve you had, because you see that slope is coming from the original allocation curve. So if I give you a different allocation rule, you will iron and reserve price in different places, because you're doing so to make the budget bind. That's crucial, because if you recall single dimensional linear agents, you always iron and reserve price in the same place, right? It doesn't matter what the allocation rule was. You always iron places where the revenue curve is, is not concave, and you always reserve price where it, it's, the virtual value goes to negative, right? That is a key difference in what's happening for nonlinear agents. <coughs>
Okay, so the way that you make the allocation rule worse is going to depend on what your original allocation rule was for nonlinear agents. On the other hand, in the unit demand uh, case, uh, the uh, optimal auction is basically a uniform price with reserve. You're going to start allocating the very the people who have the highest favorite item their uh, outcome and gradually lower that until the marginal revenue from doing so goes below zero. Okay, so essentially you do a greedy algorithm and this point where it goes below zero does not depend on the allocation rule. It depends on where the marginal revenue of the exanti problems uh, uh, cross zero. Okay, and you get this mechanism which has higher probabilities for stronger types and lower probability for lower types, but you basically are doing this uniform pricing. Okay, these are supposed to show the density of sort of the probability you're allocating. Okay, where darker is higher probability and lighter is lower probability. Okay, and I, as I said before, the square root of one third for the uniform zero one squared example is the reserve price you use regardless of what the original allocation constraint was. Okay, you're always going to uh, modify the allocation constraint y in the exact same way for any allocation constraint y hat, sorry. Okay, so the reason why I went through these examples first just showing you what they looked like was because I wanted you to see how different they are when you put them into this framework of um, interim optimization. Okay, optimization subject, subject to an allocation constraint. Okay, um, so the unit demand example is actually special. Um, and uh, I want to use it as an example to introduce this concept that I'll call revenue linearity. Okay, which is a concept I had on one of my earlier slides but didn't define, and so now we'll define it. Okay, so um, notice that the intermodal mechanism is just a, exactly a convex combination of these ex ante optimal mechanisms. Okay, I just look at the allocation rule and I offer that mechanism with the probability. I basically do the same sampling trick I did in the very first slide. I, I sample from the density of the allocation constraint to figure the probability. I offer that ex ante optimal mechanism. Okay, the intermodal uh, revenue is just a convex combination of ex ante optimal mechanisms. That means essentially the revenue operator is a linear operator. Okay. Um, another property is the ordering on types. So if I go back here and I ask, can I order the types? The answer is yes, I can order the types. Types with higher value for their favorite item are always higher than types with lower value for their favorite item. That's the ordering on types that in, in the optimal mechanism. Okay. And that will always be the ordering of types in any optimal mechanism. Notice that's not going to happen here. So all these guys have the same order. They're ordered equally. Okay, and as you change the allocation rule, the set of those who are equally ordered changes. Okay, so in the public budget case, you don't necessarily have an ordering on types that's always respected by every optimal mechanism. Okay, so good. Uh, the definition of revenue linearity is the following. The optimal revenue for allocation con constraint y is uh, where y is equal to the sum of two other allocation constraints. It's just equal to the sum of the revenues for the, the other allocation constraints. So that's sort of linearity of revenue. Okay. Um, here's a cool theorem. It, this orderability is not a coincidence. In any setting that satisfies re revenue linearity, you're going to get orderability for free. Okay, so let's take any allocation constraint I wanted here. Notice that it's always going to order the people who have the highest value for their favorite item above people who have a lower value for their favorite item, meaning the quantiles I get are always in the, sa the, the same quantiles mapping for any allocation constraint. That's not going to happen here, right? Because there's these guys, the set of people who are pooled here is going to change as I change the allocation constraint. 
Okay, cool. So I'm ready to now give you my ex ante reduction. So I'm going to reduce a multiplayer optimization problem to a collection of single player optimization problems in the case that the single player problems are revenue linear. So think, for example, uniform 0, 1 squared, the red blue car example. Okay? Um, and this is basically reinterpreting the single dimensional theory in a multi dimensional, in a more general space, and that's uh, from this paper uh, with a bunch of my collaborators. <coughs> okay, so I want to basically define marginal revenue much more generally. Uh, so given an ex ante constraint Q, R of Q is just the optimal ex ante revenue, as we've sort of described. I'll call that the revenue curve. I'll take its derivative with respect to the, the quantile constraint and call that the marginal revenue. Okay, so revenue linearity implies the optimal revenue for y hat is the marginal revenue of y. In other words, this, just like we had for the single dimensional linear case. Okay, here's the proof. It's the same proof. Uh, R is the optimal revenue for a step function at q hat. Uh, view uh, y hat as a convex combination of step functions. Their coefficients here. Uh, well, revenue linearity implies that the revenue of any convex combination is equal to the convex combination of the revenue equal now, not an upper bound or lower bound. It's equal. So I get the theorem. Uh, and then I integrate by parts and get the marginal revenue version of it. Okay, and so then you might ask, well, what's the marginal revenue mechanism? Well, it's sort of the natural generalization of what we saw as the marginal revenue mechanism for linear players where instead of just offering the price that corresponds to when the guy would be sold, I offer him the ex ante mechanism that corresponds to the lowest, the highest quantile he could have and still be served. Okay, rather than go through, and you know, you have the same theorems, um, rather than go through that in detail, I want to do the example. Okay, so let's look at the red blue car example with types IID uniform zero one. Okay, that's this example. We know that's what uh, ex ante mechanisms look like. Marginal revenue mechanism. That's this guy. Okay, the marginal revenue mechanism. Um, so uh, I want to figure out what the optimal ex ante things to do are. Well, it's just post price uh, square root one minus q hat, as we saw from before, right? So and then I can calculate the revenue curve as a function of q hat, which is just q hat times the price I post, because that's the measure of guys who buy at this price. Okay, and that is the plot of this function, which has its maximum at two-thirds. Okay, um, so to get a quantile for a type, uh, I just sort of see, I just sort of invert the function. Uh, I find the sort of the highest quant uh, type I can make where that guy is still served. That's the quantile of the type. Um, what does it mean to maximize this? Well, serve the players with the highest quantiles subject to a quantile reserve of two-thirds which in value space is square root one third. That's the mechanism I said was often before. You post a uniform, uh, you serve to the player with the highest value of their favorite item and you charge them the second highest price or the reserve of uh, square root one third. Uh, well, so if you look at the mechanism, I always get something that's ex ante feasible, ex post feasible because I'm optimizing the total marginal revenue subject to ex post feasibility. Okay? I then have to figure out, you know, how much could this player lower their, or lower their, uh, raise their quantile, become weaker, and still be served by the mechanism. Okay, given the other marginal revenues, there's some point where they cross that feasibility constraint, which is deterministic actually, right? So you either serve them or you don't serve them, right? It's deterministic and you find that quantile and you offer them the mechanism that corresponds to the ex ante mechanism for that quantile. And that ex ante mechanism is going to be deterministic. It's going to serve the player or not serve the player. Okay, and for people above the quantile, it always serves. People below the quantile, it never serves. That's what revenue linear, li linearity gets you. Okay, that's a good question. 
Um, and I sort of went over it quickly. Yeah. There's another way of making this a one-dimensional problem, which is just to sell a car, and then once the guy has bought it, he tells you whether he wants it red or blue, and then his value is just the maximum of the, uh, the two. Yeah, so but what I'm doing here is proving that that projection is optimal. Because that projection is not always optimal. If the distributions were different, for instance, if they're uniform 5.6, we know from Thanosoulis that that is not optimal. Okay? So the point is, is in this case, it happened to be optimal because for the uniform 0, 1, things are special. Okay? It won't always be for, for multidimensional linear players that revenue linearity holds. Excellent point. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, but what's amazing is once I prove that I can project to a single dimension, now I can, as uh, Eric says, just run the single dimensional mechanism and I'm done. And I can generalize it to any setting where the single dimensional mechanisms are understood. Right? Then I can have a red-blue car in that setting with players with two types and it's always just project and then optimize the single dimensional problem. But I have to prove that by analyzing the multi-dimensional problem, which is going to happen after lunch. Awesome. Um, so that's sort of the answer when things are nice and revenue linear. So I now want to tell you um, how I can use this, uh, this framework of marginal revenue maximization even when things are not nice and linear. And that's really convenient because marginal revenue is something we understand really well. All of single dimensional mechanism design is marginal revenue mechanisms. So everything we've learned about single dimensional linear mechanism design, we can apply to the marginal revenue mechanism. And uh, many of the results proved there will go through automatically for that mechanism. And so it's nice to see when it's approximately optimal. OK, so the stuff I'm going to talk about today is a particular approach to show it's uh, uh, approximately optimal using a really excellent correlation gap theorem by uh, one of Tim's former students, Chi Chi Yan. Did you call that theorem? Huh? What did you correlation gap. That term will not be important for the talk. It's a theorem. It's, it's something that comes from stochastic optimization. Um, it's a very, there's a very nice theory of it, but we won't go into the details, unfortunately. But I do have a book you could read. <laughs> OK, so here's, um, I want to give you um, the main challenge of approximation. So I want to show something simple is close to optimal. And unfortunately, the optimal thing is complex. So maybe putting my finger exactly on it is going to be a challenge. OK, so how do I analytically show something as close to something complex that I can't exactly understand? OK, so that's the main challenge. Here is a general approach. I want to take the original problem and relax it in a way that simplifies it a lot. I then want to solve the relaxed problem. And I'm going to get an upper bound on the best thing I could do in my original problem. Because I've just relaxed constraints, so I get something better, more revenue in the relaxed problem. Um, but it's going to be infeasible for the original problem, probably, because I've relaxed some constraints. So unless I'm lucky, it's infeasible. So then I want to fix the relaxed solution to make it feasible without losing too much revenue. And if I can do that, I can prove that the, solu the fixed solution, hopefully it's still simple, is a good approximation to the optimal thing, which is upper bounded by the relaxed program. OK, this is kind of a generic method for doing approximation. Uh, and, and while there are plenty of examples where you don't do this, this is a sort of predominant example, uh, uh, approach. OK, uh, I'm going to talk about that approach. In particular, I'm going to talk about what I call the ex-ante relaxation. OK, I'll call a profile of ex-ante constraints uh, ex-ante feasible if there exists an ex post feasible mechanism that has those probability as those uh, as marginal allocation probabilities, meaning uh, Q hat I in this mechanism is the ex ante probability you allocate to player I. Uh, 
Okay? So if there exists a mechanism for your distribution that induces those allocation probabilities, then it's ex ante feasible. Let me give a real simple example. If I have a single item auction, then ex ante feasibility just means that some of the probabilities is the most one. Right? Really simple example. So if you don't like this, just think about this. Okay? So the ex ante relaxation is the following. I want to optimize revenue instead of subject to ex post feasibility, subject to ex ante feasibility. Okay, now ex ante feasibility is a relaxation of ex post feasibility, right? Because it came from an ex post feasible mechanism. So every ex post feasible mechanism induces ex ante probabilities that satisfy this constraint, right? Good. So what is that optimization? Well, I want to maximize, well, we know what the optimal thing to do for each player given an ex ante constraint is. So now that sort of decomposes the problems across players. So just do, you know, find the Q hat that's ex ante feasible that maximizes the sum of the revenue curves of those Q hats. For, for um, the single item case, you guys know exactly what this is, right? This is just equate marginal revenues and find the Q hats that equate marginal revenues. Okay? Given the relation between marginal revenues and virtual values in the single player problem, I call that a uniform virtual pricing. Because equating marginal revenues means the marginal revenue of sort of the price I'm offering each player is equal. Okay? Note, I offer each player uh, uh, independently their ex ante mechanism. They get to take it or leave it. This might produce ex post infeasible outcomes. But I don't care. This is my ex ante relaxation. Okay? So... Because this is a relaxation, the revenue, optimal revenue for it is bigger than the optimal revenue uh, in the original ex post constrained problem. Okay, here's a simple example for single dimensional agents. So two agents, uniform values, single object. Um, so ex ante optimal because it's symmetric would be just the post price one half to both players. Right, the total probability is one, right? And the revenue is one half because you get a quarter from each guy. Of course, when they are both value above a half, you sell two items and you shouldn't have with the original ex post constraint, but we didn't care. We relaxed the ex post constraint. Okay, notice the optimal revenue is, of course, worse than this. It's 5 twelfths. For those of you who've studied auctions with two players before know that. Um, <laughs> good. Okay, that's my relaxation. Continuing with my agenda, um, I now want to show that. Uh, if I offer the ex ante, I, I now need, I have these prices, right? But these are going to violate feasibility. So I need to get back ex post feasibility. So I'm just going to do a simple greedy heuristic. I'm going to sort the players by their price or by uh, the probability of allocating times the revenue I get from, uh, from the revenue curve, right? And then go through them in, in decreasing order and offer them their ex ante mechanism. And I might run out of stuff before I get to them and too bad. Okay, so um, offer the ex ante optimal prices in decreasing order, uh, and the theorem is you're going to get a 1.58 approximation, um, which is again the same as Tim's uh, 0.63 approximation, but the reciprocal. Okay, I want to give you the proof sketch of this. Uh, this proof comes from the usual place you get the number 1 minus 1 over e, unlike uh, Tim's price of anarchy bound. Um, so it's the ex ante optimal is symmetric. Uh, so I'm going to do this proof for ID agents. This, the theorem holds for more general, like it holds for uh, single item and non-ID agents. But I'm just going to do the proof for ID agents for simplicity. The ex ante optimal thing is symmetric. And uh, obviously, you're then going to post price, uh, use ex ante probability 1 over n. So you get the ex ante probability to sum to 1. Um, so well then, what's the ex ante optimal revenue? Well, from each player, I run the 1 over n optimal mechanism to get revenue r of 1 over n. And I, they're n players, so I get n times that. That's ex ante optimal. So what if I offer these guys in decreasing prices? Well, all the prices are the same. So actually, it's, there are no decreasing prices here because it's IID. So I just offer them in some order. I only had one item, though. So 
if somebody comes and wants to buy, we sell. Otherwise, we don't sell. So let's try to analyze that. It's the probability that any agent wants to buy times the ex ante revenue conditioned on some agent buying. Right? Well, what's the probability that any agent buy? Well, it's 1 minus the probability that no one buys. Since I'm the quantile reserve is 1 over n, the probability that no one buys is one, uh, minus 1 over n to the n. Right? Um, and so 1 minus that. OK, and what is the revenue conditioned on buying? Well, conditioned on buying, you're going to give me n times r of 1 over n, because r of 1 over n is the revenue we get for selling with x ante probably 1 over n. So conditioned on buying, I normalize by the probability I get n times that. And that's awesome, because that is 1 minus 1 over e times n times r of 1 over n, which is exactly my upper bound. So my lower bound is the desired approximation of my upper bound. It's the limit with n, yeah. It's better for smaller n. OK, um, good. So uh, I want to, that's sort of this approach. I'll uh, give you an example in a second. I just want to sort of, before I do that, tell you some sort of general theory of what's going on here. OK, so um, I want to use this marginal revenue framework to understand uh, good mechanisms when I don't have revenue linearity. So I'm going to find a marginal revenue-based mechanism to be one that looks to every agent like a convex combination of the ex-ante marginal revenues. Okay? Not all mechanisms will look like convex combinations to the agent of ex-ante alpha mechanisms, but if it does, I'll call it a, a marginal revenue-based mechanism. Okay? The challenge here is that, in general, for non-revenue linear agents, the optimal mechanism will not be a marginal revenue-based mechanism. Here's the observation. The optimal ex-ante relaxation is a marginal revenue-based mechanism. I compute the quantiles. Uh, the relax I relax the feasibility constraint to ex-ante. I compute the best ex-ante pro allocation probabilities. And I offer each agent the ex-ante optimal revenue for that quantile. The, their quantile constraint, right? So the ex ante relaxation is, is marginal revenue based. And so, um, so are all single dimensional linear agents mechanisms. Any mechanism you ever have for a single dimensional linear agent is marginal revenue based by sort of the revenue equivalence. Okay? That means we have a meta theorem that if you have any approximation result for a single dimensional linear agent with respect to the ex ante relaxation, that result will automatically extend to uh, general agents. Automatically extend. Okay? And there was you know, about five years of research in computer science actually answering this question, extending, uh, proving single dimensional approximation results by comparing to the ex ante relaxation. Okay? So uh, this marginal revenue generalization of uh, this approach of marginal revenue generalizes all of that theory to crazy nonlinear agents and multidimensional preferences, whatever you want, any kind of agent. And they need to be the um, th there are some interpretations of these mechanisms uh, based on looking at what they end up doing. Um, those interpretations might not be the same when you start using wacky. Um, uh, wacky ex ante mechanisms that are optimal for wacky single player non revenue linear problems. Okay? Don't worry about it. But can't, can't you always just look at the direct mechanism? Uh, when I say wacky, I'm still talking about direct. The point is, is uh, they can be, the ex ante alpha mechanisms can be really strange. Okay. Um, in fact, you know, some of your papers on risk aversion showed how strange they are, yeah. right? Um, and so those mechanisms, if, if I might have interpreted this theorem as saying price posting is good for a single dimensional case, because the ex ante thing looks like price posting. But when I use it for your, you know, CARA risk averse players, I'm not going to get price posting 
as my thing. So I need to reinterpret what the solution means. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so the corollary we get of this approach is basically the thing we saw in the last slide for every sort of single item environment. And so my red blue car is an example of a single item environment. I have one car. I can paint it red blue and maybe even green, right? That's a single item environment. And the, sequ the sequential posted pricing I got from the previous slide is going to be this E of E minus one approximation. That's an example of this meta theorem. Okay, I want to apply this now to public budgets, which was our example of a nonlinear agent to just see what we get. Okay, so um, recall the we serve with XRT probability Q hat, uh, and it looks kind of like this. We have a lottery where you buy with some probability to exactly make the area your budget. Okay, and that was the general theorem. And so here's the corollary, and this is one of the things on my very first slides. I said that for IID uniform single item agents with a public budget, offering the agents the 1 over n plus b lottery at price b is a 1.58 approximation to optimal. Uh, in a, uh, and giving it to the first agent who says, yes, I want to buy it, and then realizes the coin and, and wins the item. Okay, so a sequential uh, mechanism. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm doing great. Um, so I now want to talk about uh, the interim reduction without revenue linearity. Okay, so I just saw the interim, uh, the the uh, ex ante reduction with revenue linearity was nice and easy. We saw how to use it to, without revenue linearity, get approximation mechanisms, simple approximation mechanisms that use the same theory as the single dimensional theory. Um, I now want to turn to the more complex problem where I actually want the optimal mechanism for these nasty non revenue linear cases. Okay, so here's the approach. Um, I'm going to define a profile of interim allocation constraints for my N agents to be one allocation constraint for each player. I'm going to call it interim feasible if there exists an ex post feasible mechanism which on that distribution induces this profile of interim allocation constraints. Okay, so remember and this is nothing to do with an IC mechanism, actually any ex post feasible mechanism, regardless of IC. So what does an ex post feasible mechanism do? It maps types to whether players win or not. When types come from a distribution, it maps types to probabilities. The, uh, the, the, there's a probability that any type is served when they're from a the distribution. Okay, so take that all in expectation. Uh, any mechanism will induce a profile of interim allocation constraints for all the players. Uh, a profile of interim allocation rules for all the players and I'm going to take it uh, as a constraint. Okay, so here's a theorem which is sort of obvious. I'm not going to prove uh, the optimal revenue is given by the program maximize over interim feasible allocation constraints. The optimal revenue for that allocation constraint. Okay, so. Um, Here's what I'm going to hope to do in my remaining time. Um, I have some slides on some stuff that's uh, more advanced, which I might get to, but I, I might end up skipping it. I want to understand better what interim feasibility means with some examples. And then I want to look at the symmetric case where things turn out to be actually really simple. Um, uh, and if, if I get to it, I'll, I'll show you some pictures of the more general case. Okay, so let's have some examples. So here are two allocation constraints. The lottery, flip a coin with probably one half, serve a player, right? All the types are equal and they get served with allocation probably a half. Or uh, this mechanism, which for some ordering on types serves the high types, the, the types that have measure uh, the, high, the, the, the strongest half 
measure of quant uh, types and doesn't serve the weakest half measure of types. These are two allocation rules. Let's suppose I have a single item. Which of these profiles of allocation rules for two players are interim feasible? Is it possible for me to design a mechanism that implements for both players the lottery? Sure, flip a coin, give it to player one or player two. <coughs> right? What's the allocation rule of that mechanism? It's the lottery, the 50 50 lottery for each player. What about player one has the lottery and player two has this allocation constraint? Is the. Is that interim feasible? No. Yes. What do I do? Give if. Give it to the second one if he's a high type. Otherwise, give it to the first one. What happens in the interim? The first guy gets allocated with probably a half, right? Which is what he needs. And the second guy gets allocated with his allocation rule, which is what, he, what the second player needs. What about C? Here's the point. C is not feasible. Why? Well, if two high types show up, I can't serve them both the item. Okay, so I'm going to give these mechanisms names. So A is the lottery, B is the dictator, player two first gets a shot at it, otherwise player, uh, player one gets it, and C I call the double dictator, which is infeasible. You can't have two dictators. Okay, um, note the probability that uh, Uh, the probability that someone is high in the second in the case C, probably that someone is high is one minus the probability that no one is high. The probability that no one high is high is a quarter, right? A half times a half is probably that both people are low. Okay, so the probability that someone is high is three quarters. Okay. Um, but how much do I have to allocate to high types in the double dictator mechanism? Well, I need to allocate a half measure to both of them, which is a total of one. So the expected number of items I have to allocate to high types is one. I have to allocate an expected one number of items to high types, but the um, probability that I see a high type is three quarters. How can I allocate an expected one item to high types if I only see a high type with probably three quarters. That is why uh, C is infeasible, right? And this sort of question I'm asking here is exactly the question that's generalized as you know, a Borders uh, theorem of, of interim feasibility. Okay. Um, good. So I want to uh, now talk about the symmetric case. So having uh, some... I wasn't sure what the punchline is. There's a literature that deals... I'm going to get to it. Yeah. So this is just some examples to understand what it means to be interim feasible because um, that definition on the previous slide is, is really kind of uh, abstract. So I wanted to just give some examples. Okay. Um, good. So now I want to look at the symmetric case. Um, and I'm supposing that I'm trying to solve this optimization problem and I have a symmetric case. So players are IID and I have maybe a single item to sell or something. Okay, so two agents, uh, distribution F and a common budget, say, is our typical nonlinear example. Um, one item. Uh, so here's the fact, uh, 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 amazing fact. Uh, Every symmetric, oh, th this is actually not amazing. The next fact is amazing. So every symmetric convex optimization has a symmetric optimal solution to it. Okay, so um, I can use that fact to prove this lemma, which is actually a really important lemma. The strongest quantile wins allocation constraint is the optimal ex post ex feasible allocation constraint for any symmetric environment. <coughs> okay, so. Just going back to the previous slide, that means when I'm optimizing this, I don't care what these functions are, the revenue functions. 
I'm always going to use the same allocation constraint to optimize it, which is going to make my problem a lot easier. Okay? Every symmetric convex, uh, the strongest quantile wins is the optimal ex post feasible allocation constraint uh, for that optimization program. Okay? I want to give you uh, uh, the proof of this. Um, and it, the proof of this is basically taking that example that we had on the previous slide and just generalizing it. Okay? So for n equals two agents, strongest quantile wins has this allocation rule, right? One minus q. If you're quantile q, you win probably one minus q, right? If you're quantile zero, you win probably one. If you're quantile one, you win probably zero. It's just the decreasing line, right? Because quantiles are always uniform. Okay? So I claim that any feasible allocation rule that's symmetric is feasible for this allocation constraint, meaning this is only sort of mass is shifted downward compared to strongest quantile wins. Okay? Good. Let's go for a contradiction. Suppose y is infeasible for y hat. There has to be exist so what's the definition of feasibility, right? It was based on these cumulative allocation rules. It says the total allocation probability before some quantile for y hat is higher than the total probability for y is, big, is higher than the total probability that stronger quantiles are served in y hat. Okay, good. Let's just uh, look at some facts about this q hat. The probability there exists an agent who's one of these higher than, uh, stronger than q hat is exactly, the probability that one agent is, is stronger than q hat is exactly q hat. The probability there exists an agent is one minus one minus q hat squared. That's just what we did on the previous slide, but more generally. Okay? Simplifying, it's that. Okay? I, and again, what is the total probability I allocate to one of these agents according to y hat? Well, I just integrate the allocation rule and I get this. Okay, what's the probability I allocate to two of the agents? It's twice that. And notice those are equal. And that's because y hat is feasible for the setting, right? I have one item, and y hat's the allocation rule that comes from highest quantile wins. That only ever sells one item. So that was a feasible allocation rule. So it's always the case that the probability I see a player is uh, not going to be worse than the expected number of players, uh, the, the expected number of players I see is never going to be uh, less than the probability I need to serve to those players. Okay, and in fact, it's going to be tight everywhere because this is the strongest thing you can do. So that's why those are equal. Okay, so the expected number served is equal to the expected number realized. Okay, but now for the contradiction, you assume that capital Y was strictly bigger than Y hat, which means this inequality does not hold for Y, capital Y, right? the number of people you have to serve is more than the number of people who show up. So you can't implement that y by the same, ex the same argument. Okay? So strongest quantile wins is optimal. Okay? So as I said, strongest quantile wins is independent of the single agent problems. So now my optimization problem is super easy. I just, for each player, find the best thing subject to that. Right? So what's the corollary? The optimal mechanism for the all pay auction, irons the top and reserve prices at the bottom, uh, which is exactly what we had in one of the first slides. If you have this allocation constraint, right, you iron the top and reserve price at the bottom. So what do you do if you have multiple players? The exact same thing, right? And you iron this way and reserve price that way. Okay. As far as I know, I said almost just to hedge, as far as I know, all positive results in the literature for nonlinear mechanism design uh, in symmetric cases are based on this fact. The fact that because it's symmetric, the ex ante uh, allocation constraints uh, don't change uh, given fu the fundamentals of the problem. And so you only have one thing to look at and you always optimize for highest quantile wins. Okay? Notice that highest quantile wins for two players looks like a line. For three players, it would look like a quadratic, et cetera. 
right? We always know what that function looks like, given the number of players. OK, um, this property that we've been talking about actually is a general characterization of uh, interim feasibility. It's uh, uh, known as Borders theorem. And it says that given any uh, upper bound on the strength of the players of types, it says the expected number of types that you should serve who are stronger than that bound on their quantile has to be less than, the for a single player, the probability that one of those players shows up. You can't serve players more often than the player shows up. I want to show you the picture that proves this. So um, it's convenient to write um, the, what's happening in this. Uh, and I'm going to do this for the examples we saw before with the dictator mechanism and the double dictator mechanism, okay, where the dictator mechanism was feasible and the double dictator was not feasible. Okay? So what I'm going to do is set up a network flow problem in order to visualize this. Okay, in my network flow problem, I have probability going to every realizable type profile. Those are all one quarter. Okay, that realizable type profile profile shows up and can allocate one item. So that one quarter probability can go to either L1 or L2. Okay, good. A mechanism tells you, the uh, ex ante allocation rule tells you the probability that L1 should be served, and by the dictator mechanism. Uh, L1 is never served. The lower type of the, of the, uh, of, of, oh, I maybe switched them. The, the lower type of the dictator is never served, right? Double dic uh, it's a dictator mechanism. If he's low, he's never served. Good. The high type, on the other hand, of the dictator is always served. Okay? And the low and high type of the other guy are served probably one half. Okay? So that sets up a graph where I can, these numbers I've talked about, uh, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter on all these edges, and one, one half, one half, uh, zero, sets up capacities on a network flow problem. And you want to know if there's a feasible flow that sends all the total probability. Okay, if there is, you're good. If there isn't, you're, go you're not good. And here is an example where the dotted dashed edges are ones I didn't use, and the solid edges are where I did use for the double dictator mechanism. Right? If the low type shows up, if it's, if it's low, the first player is low and the second player is low, then the low player gets it. If the first player is low and the second player is high, the low player gets it. That was how we allocated in the dictator mechanism. Right? If the second player is high, then no matter what the low player is, the high player gets it, collects the one half plus one half, makes it one, uh, and sorry, one quarter plus quarter, it makes it uh, one half and a half, which sums to one. Good, and so this total probability is the total probability of the, that was going in, and so everything is good. But just as a matter of curiosity, this reduction to a max flow min cut problem is the argument that these guys are using. This so argument is actually in a new paper, which I'm about to cite down here. What, the, what does Mirandor do? Uh, I have not gone through all those papers in details after I knew the proof that I liked. Um, so uh, this paper does a network flow like this, and it actually generalizes it beyond single item to matroid constraints, which I'm not going to define or tell about. I just want to tell you what happens badly with a double dictator. So the beginning of the graph just is based on the probabilities. The end of the graph is based on the interim allocation rule. Right? So double dictator says both the high types are served and both the low types are not served. Okay, so if I need those capacities, well, then I can find a cut in this graph which doesn't have the total flow, which means I can't send the total flow all the way to from A to B. Okay, so it's basically a min flow max cut theorem, which says that uh, the why it's a characterization. It's the same as min flow max cut. Okay, that's the picture I like to, to draw to think about what's going on here. Okay. Um, I have a bunch more pictures, but I'm going to refer you to the and more general results beyond. So this was um, for matroids. You can do this and get nice characterizations, which then you can, then you can use to optimize. Um, and there's things you can do beyond matroids, uh, which I'm going to skip. And there's some really pretty pictures you can look at in the book. Good. Let me just summarize um, what we've done in this first uh, the first part. Uh, so 
we looked at the ex ante reduction and we generalized the single dimensional framework of marginal revenue to general problems. And we showed that for the single agent problem being the ex ante allocation constrained problems, uh, we can compose them by the, multi, the marginal revenue mechanism. Uh, and that works whenever the preferences are revenue linear. Okay? And that's any single dimensional linear utility and some multi dimensional linear utility satisfy revenue linearity, like the uniform zero one square. Okay, we saw an approximate ex ante reduction, um, where again, the single agent problem we care about is the constraint on the ex ante allocation probability. Um, the multi agent competition, you could either look at the, the uh, marginal revenue mechanism, which is well defined, or you can just use these simple posted pricings if you like those better, because they're actually simpler. And they guarantee that 1.58 approximation, for example, for a single item. Okay? No <laughs> preferences on assumptions. Uh, no, preferences, no assumptions on preferences. Okay? And then there's the more general interim reduction, uh, which um, I've stated here in this gen most general uh, statement, which I didn't actually get to cover, um, which the single agent problem I have to solve is the interim allocation rule constrained problem. Um, I can then compose those using a stochastic weighted optimization, which I didn't talk about. See the book. No assumptions on the preferences. Okay. Um, lunchtime. <laughs>